bolt action basic training video. Today we're going to be covering some of the special weapons and transports because honestly a foot slogging infantry force doesn't get you around very fast. So we're going to need some special weapons to enhance the ability of our men and we're going to need some transports to get them moving across the battlefield more quickly. So kind of to prepare, just kind of level set things here, we're going to start adding a couple extra rules to what we've already covered before. And then we're going to start actually talking about some of the variations that this will, this will provide. What you're going to see now are going to be things called pen value, penetration value. And that essentially means a weapon is more dangerous, more deadly, if you will. So you're going to, we're going to learn a little bit about that. And the way transports work in the game is very, very uh, fun, and in my opinion, a lot of fun. Because in the game, each transport has a capacity and its number of models. Number, not number of units. So as long as you have the room, you can put multiple units in one vehicle. There's advantages and disadvantages to that, but we're going to lay, out, lay this out for you and you can see how you can use transports in your infantry army. Alright, so stay tuned. We're going to go down now to the classroom and we're going to talk about the rules as far as you know how do vehicles move, what the different types of vehicles there are, because transports Though you know, they're a, a really a non-combat vehicle, they're really, they're, it's interesting because they're all three types of vehicles are represented in just the transport section. You have tracked, half-tracked, and wheeled vehicles. And so you're going to have to learn all the rules for those down in the next part of this video. As far as special weapons go, I want you guys to think in terms of anti-tank rifles, snipers, and things like flamethrowers. These are weapons, infantry weapons, that will be put on the field that doesn't require a vehicle to operate. Okay, these are man portable weapons that are a little more dangerous than the infantry weapons in the squad itself. So stick around. Let's move down down to the uh, classroom setting, and we'll go over these specific rules before we get into the real action. Uh, all right, welcome to the classroom. We had a couple things to go through. Uh, there's a the field looks really busy right now. That's because there's a, we're going to cover a lot. There's only a few special rules. Let's talk about some special infantry teams. Uh, there are some others in the book, but they all kind of follow the same rule. If you remember, a team weapon requires multiple models, and these are special infantry units. Okay. Uh, kind of now that we're going to talk about some adding vehicles in, there are three types of units in bolt action. There is number one. There's infantry. That's everything we've seen so far. Mortars, anti-tank guns, or, or sorry, rifles, bazookas, machine guns, infantry squads, your officer, a medic, those are all infantry. Then you've got artillery. Artillery is your anti-tank guns, your howitzers, or field guns, and your anti-aircraft guns. And then you have vehicles, which obviously are things that have wheels, or tracks, or a combination. Okay. All right, so let's start with the team. The team weapons, the infantry stuff, some special things. Let's talk about the medic. He's an off, he's an HQ type unit. We're, you're not going to see him in any of the field exercises, but I figure we'll cover him here. He, ha he has some utility, not necessarily a very competitive choice, and not all uh, platoons throughout the war had a medic. My, you know, my early war did not have a medic at the platoon level. They had it at the company level. And but Polish First Armored Division later war a lot of the platoons had a medic. So whether you want to include it or not, you can have one in your platoon that you field. He is non-combatant. He cannot fire a weapon. He has a pistol. That's for self-defense in close combat. But he cannot fire. However, any unit that takes a wound that is within six inches of that model gets a, to roll a die. On a 6 plus he ignores the wound. Now this is for all small arms fire. This In this video we're going to talk about small arms and heavy weapons. In fact I'll put up a graphic here real quick showing you the list small arms compared to the list of heavy weapons. You'll notice, take a look closely, on the pen column. You'll see all small arms are zero, all heavy weapons are plus one or better. That's the difference between heavy weapons and small arms. A medic cannot save you if you're hit with a heavy weapon. Heavy machine gun, mortar, sorry, this medic's not going to save you. Hit with a rifle, submachine gun, light machine gun, medium machine gun, you're fine. He'll, he could save you. 
All right, so that's the uh, medic. Now, the there are several different options for anti-tank. There's anti-tank rifles. There's here's a Piat. You've got uh, the Bazooka, Panzer Shrek, Panzer Faust, all these kind of things. They're really essentially just a, a short-range infantry weapon. Now, granted, Bazookas have a 24-inch range. Piats, Panzer Faust have 12-inch range, but they have a very high pen value. It's five. For Piat, six for Bazooka, I believe. Uh, definitely, I don't play U.S., uh, but definitely six for the German Panzerfaust and Panzer Shrek. That means when it hits a target, you roll your D6 to wound or penetrate, and you add that penetration value to the die roll. So this, if, if he hit, for example, a truck, which would need a, which is a soft fisting vehicle, needs a six to kill. I'll cover that in a second. So it would be 5 plus the die roll would have to, to, to wound. Now, unfortunately, whenever you roll a penetration or a wound roll, a natural 1, no matter how many pens you've got, that is a, not a wound. It is not a penetrating we a hit on a vehicle. It's simply nothing. Okay. Yes, you did hit, and you deliver the pin, or multiple pins potentially, but in... We'll talk about those in the uh, artillery sec, uh, school. Here, you're going to still deliver the pin, but you're not going to take anything out. Had he rolled two, yeah, two plus five, that's seven. That's going to kill everything. Or, seriously, it could damage a vehicle, and it will kill any man, okay? But again, it's only going to kill one person. So, I mean, that's a, a, how the bazooka or, or piat would work. Sniper, they've got some neat special rules. Let's talk about that. First of all, they have, they are have equipped with a rifle, and these in in the British handbook anyway, the assistant has a pistol. Check your army books carefully because each army has a slightly different loadout of weapons. All right, sniper has the ability to do one of two things. He can either fire and move, you know, advance normally and fire his rifle as a rifle, which is a 24 inch range, at whatever you know target using normal modifiers. He can also do that at units within 12 inches. However, he can, if he decides to not move and simply fire at a unit that is more than 12 inches away from him, has to be more than 12, but less than 36, he can use his scope, which means he can roll and he has no modifiers at all. Now we're going to cover more team uh, weapons now uh, as far as uh, one of the special team rules. The only modifiers a sniper is going to have are the pins that may or may not be on him and the loss of an assistant. Okay, On a team weapon, if you lose, as long as you have your assistant, you have no penalties, but if you lose your assistant, whether it's a Piat assistant or the sniper's assistant, you are at minus one to hit because now you have to do the function of loading and firing. Uh, opening up canisters of ammunition, firing. You don't have the spotter to help you acquire the target as well. So you're, you're at minus one. Okay, very important aspect of team weapons. So don't think that the, uh, you know, having, losing your, you know, assistance is not such a big deal because it does actually affect your, your unit's effectiveness. All right, so anyway. Now, if they hit, they're not going to be penalized by terrain at all. So they're you know, a small, the fact it's a small team of the target. They just hit on a three or better. So now, in my experience, I roll a lot of ones and twos of snipers, but they can be effective. Now, what they can, if you hit, automatically pin. Very important. Put the pin on the target, and that's what the name of the game is, right? But every hit, uh, sorry, every wound is you normal, no, use normal wound roll. So quality. So infantry, uh, experience infantry. Needs a three up uh, to kill. Regulars four up. Veterans five up. Soft skin vehicles, which aren't on the table right now, a uh, six up. In order to d to actually do some something to it. However, that sh wound roll on an infantry unit, if he wounds, snipers always, as long as the the target unit is more than twelve inches away, they always get to select the dead unit, the dead model. So if a sniper hits an infantry squad, he can decide to take out the NCO, or take out the light machine gun, or to take out the flamethrower, 
Or if he hits the officer team, he can take out the officer. Now the assistant sticks around, but the officer's gone. Okay? He can take out the entire mortar team. He can take out the entire machine gun team. All right? Because that's what a sniper's for. All right? Very useful unit. Uh, it costs about the same as a regular infantry, un, unbuffed infantry squad. So no with no special weapons. All right. Now, probably the most feared team weapon, or this is arguable, but most feared team weapon is the flamethrower. Okay? Flamethrower team always consists of the flamethrower guy, in the case of British, it's a little round donut-shaped pack, and his assistant. Now, flamethrowers are deadly, but they're short-range. Again, team weapon, so on an exceptional damage, you can take the whole unit out by just taking the flamethrower out. If he dies, the unit goes away. If he dies, he's at minus one to hit. All right. They move at six inches like everybody else. But the range is only six inches. It's a very short range attack. So let's kind of set up really a real quick kind of a, uh, not a scenario, but a situation. I've got this unit here on in the hedge, or on the other side of the hedge here. I'll just put him here in the woods. And I'm going to put an enemy unit here in this, in this, in these ruins. Okay? They're, they're taking advantage of the cover. Well, I only have a six inch range, so I'm outside of it. But again, I can give him an advance order. He advances up to six inches, so he's going to make it up right up to the wall with his buddy. He's going to flamethrower those guys. All right, so here's how it works. Flamethrowers ignore cover completely. Obstacles, ruins, light cover, you name it, it doesn't matter. No minuses. However, he has moved, so it's minus one. Now, he has a, he's in super short range, so it kind of counteracts that. However, since it's only a six-inch range, if this target unit was, let's say, three over three inches away, let's back him up a little bit here. More than three inches away they would be considered long range and have a minus one to hit. Okay, So in this, if they were this far away, okay, it would be three to hit. They're at super short because they're within six inches. They moved. Okay, Ignore cover completely. But here he's at long range. He would need a four to hit. But since I was able to move him up here, he starts at three. He's at super short. Ignores cover. And, but he moved. I need a three to hit. I only get one roll, okay, for a flamethrower. So I roll a hit, or sorry, yeah, I roll a hit normally just once. And I hit, okay? I would have hit whether I was back here or up here. Now that I've hit with a flamethrower, I roll a d6 to determine how many hits I've actually scored. I scored five hits on that squad with the flamethrower. So I get my five dice out. Now the beauty of this is the flamethrower is a plus three penetration weapon. So let's pretend these are veterans. I kill them on fives. The problem is this is a three pen weapon. So I need a five, but I need, because it's plus three pen, it's four, three, two. I kill on twos. So I roll five dice. And ever, they're all five or two or better, the whole squad is wiped out. Now, if this were a squad that had, oh, let's just say it, it had ten guys in it. I wiped out ten, left the five standing. Now, two more things have to happen if I haven't wiped out the unit. The first one is I deliver a pin for hitting. The second one is, here, I'll put the pin up here, is I roll a D3 additional pins. One more. Now, because I've been hit with a flamethrower, the target must automatically take a morale test. So we're dealing with a morale value here, or uh, morale of 9. Well, well no, sorry, we said there were vets. So 10 minus 2. I need an 8 to stay on the table because it's a flamethrower. Regardless of whether I lost half or not, I always make this morale check. I rolled a 4, so I'm fine. He stays. Now I roll for the flamethrower. Did I run out of fuel? I roll a d6. On a 1, he's out of fuel. It's 6, so I'm good. If he runs out of fuel, 
you remove the team and the order dice from the game. It's counted as a casualty. Okay, it's a little harsh, but considering the power of the, the weapon, it's pretty good. Okay, all right. So that's how a flamethrower will work. Okay, before we go into the vehicles, I want to cover one more thing about teams. Whether it's a sniper team, a flamethrower team, piat team, you name it, whatever it might be, whatever team weapon, even if it's a medium machine gun or a mortar team, if you if it is ever reduced to one man, the last guy standing kind of a thing, they are always considered at minus one leadership. Just like if they had lost their NCO in the unit, right? So, if I shot an, a small team, and each, remember each of these was a two-man team, so I, I would have hit, put a pin on, now because I've lost at least half the unit, I have to make a morale test. So it's going to be nine, minus one for the pin, minus one for basically being the last man standing. So I need a seven just to stay on. Fortunately, I was successful with that one. So that's the danger of small teams, sorry, not small teams, but uh, the small team weapons, okay? They are a little more fragile when, because they're down, when they're down to one guy, they cut in half. So a lot of people forget that, that extra minus one, but don't forget it because that actually reduces, it makes it a little more fragile than you can normally think. All right, so with that, we'll move on to vehicles. All right. Now let's talk about transports. Now, transports, thankfully, also happen to become in a variety of shapes and sizes, and we can actually talk about the three types of vehicles. There's tracked, half-tracked, and wheeled. All right, so tracked vehicles and half-tracked vehicles move 9 inches. Wheeled vehicles move 12 inches. Okay. So whenever you give them an advance order, that's how far they move. 9, 9, and 12. If you want to run, you double it. So eight, uh, this would be 18, 18, and 24. Now this is where the roads are fun because you double the movement on roads. So as long as the unit starts on the, entirely on the road, not half off the road, but on the road, it can benefit from road movement. So if he wants to advance, advances 12 inches, doubled on a road, he can advance 24 inches. It's a long way down the table. Okay. Now, the thing is, with vehicles, you have to consider pivots separately. Tracked vehicles can only have one pivot up to 90 degrees in their advance order. They cannot pivot if you give them an or a run order. Now, tracked vehicles can go over obstacles and into rough ground. Okay? So he could, without any difficulty, advance nine inches straight forward, assuming there was no units here. Okay? Half-tracked vehicles are exactly the same. Moving nine inches can go over obstacles, into rough ground, but he can make two pivots on an advance and one pivot on a run order. Okay? Wheel vehicles... Now, this is where things get really, you're trading off a lot. Wheel vehicles obviously move faster. They still get to make two 90-degree turns within their advance of 12 inches and one 90-degree turn within a run. But they cannot cross obstacles or enter rough terrain at all. So there's a trade-off there. All right. So that's how the wheeled vehicles, tracked vehicles, half tracked vehicles work. Now let's talk about how do transports work. Very simple. To em you can start the game with a unit inside, or you can get them in during the game. If you want to get them into the game, you need to advance or run your unit so that the entire mo every model within you can get within one inch of the vehicle. If they can, you, em you can embark. Transports each have their own transport capacity. As an example, a brand, a universal carrier has, can carry five. This white scout car, car can carry uh, eight. This half-tracked uh, M3, or sorry, M5, technically it's British, can carry 12. That's the number of models you can carry. We, you can mix. So I can put my leader team into here, plus my sniper team, oh, plus my medic, all five into here, 
Oh, I can throw a Piat team into all seven of those into here. So see what I said? I can have four units inside a transport, or just you know one big unit. But pay attention to your actual transport capacity and what it is you're going to be putting into it. Okay. Now, here's where transports are great and maybe not so great. As long as they advance, the unit inside can get out. But if it runs, the unit inside cannot get out. If the unit gets into it, the vehicle cannot have moved and cannot move at all during the turn. It has to be given a down order in order for infantry to embark on it. Okay, So that's a little, you know, slows things down a bit when you're getting in and leaves the target out there to be hit. But once it's there, it's they're in. Now, here's the thing about transports. If it takes a pin, and we'll, we're gonna, let's, before we do that, we're going to set up, let's say these five men and this Piat team are in this white scout car. Okay? If I shoot it with any weapon, because these are all open top, any weapon, I will get ish, I will, you know, I successfully hit, I give a pin to that vehicle. But because this is a transport and it has guys in it, I also give the same number of pins to the units inside. So now each of the units has a pin. And all I did was hit the transport once. Okay? For every pin the transport gets, the each unit inside gets the same number of pins. This matters because now they have to make order tests to do anything while they're in that transport. In addition, if I penetrate and do damage to the transport. The, any additional pins caused by that go on to these units as well. So the pins can stack up pretty quick with the units inside. So being in a transport in a combat zone is not always a good idea, but sometimes you have to do that to get the guys into position fast. Okay? Alright, now vehicles have a slightly different uh, the way we treat them as far as moving through units and such. With a vehicle, you have to always stay more than one inch away from any enemy, or sorry, any friendly model, vehicle or infantry. Unlike infantry and which can move through each other, infantry have to, and vehicles have to stay one inch away from each other during their movement. Okay, that's extremely important. Now, so example, for example, up here, I would need to be able to actually veer off to the side here and actually get off the road in order to stay more than one inch away from them. So it matters where your units are positioned, pay very close attention so you maneuver these things around properly. Now, that really is the only uh, difference of movement vehicles versus uh, infantry. Okay. All right, so let's talk about firing uh, vehicles and kind of doing damage to vehicles. We're going to break this up into two parts. We're going to talk just about transports, but the same principles apply to other vehicles, which we'll talk about in the next lesson. So let's start with just the basic transports. You're able to bring one transport per unit in your list. That's already in your list. So if you have a leader, you can bring one transport of any type. If you have a squad, you can bring a transport of any type, whether they can fit in it or not. <clears throat> so I can have a 10-man squad of uh, infantry. Let's go ahead and I'll just put one out there. So here's a nice little 10-man squad, and I can bring this five-person half-track. Now, obviously, I can't put the unit in there because 10 is greater than 5, but I can still bring this, okay? So they're, they're not really strict about which transport you can bring for what. So the thing you need to pay attention to is for any uh, vehicle, such as a truck, or other vehicle that does not already come with a uh, machine gun or some armament, some weapon, you need to take a look at the upgrade bar uh, to see what you can add. Because a lot of times you can add something. Uh, usually it's a machine gun, either forward, point of forward or backward, or a pinto mount, which is 360. We'll talk about that in a second. But sometimes there will be a note saying you can add a medium machine gun or heavy machine gun but the transport loses the vehicle loses all of its transport and tow capability. 
When that happens, you, it's no longer considered a transport. Okay, we'll talk about those those uh, types of vehicles in the next uh, lesson. But if that happens, you cannot upgrade the truck to become a tra uh, armed transport. It becomes counted as if it was part of the armored car slot in your uh, list. So pay very close attention to let you know. So for example, in my early war polls, this Polsky Fiat uh, 621 truck does not come with a machine gun. If I decide to put a machine gun on it, it loses its transport capacity. So it becomes like an armored car. It, could, it would compete with other vehicles like the Tankette or actual armored cars that are in the in that segment section of the list. So pay very close attention to that. Now, others come with, for example, this particular half track comes armed as default with a heavy machine gun. And then you can add to it a medium machine gun on one or both sides. And that'd be either side. It doesn't you don't have to uh, arm one side first. So you can buy a half track and with a machine gun on the left or on the right. Now let's take a look at vehicle or weapon arcs. This is where things get interesting because this applies to all vehicles. So let's uh, change the cam camera angle here for a second. Alright, so here's the half track we were talking about and let's just say I've equipped both machine guns. So the way this uh, unit is written it comes with a th pinto mount or 360 degree firing heavy machine gun and it comes with a medium machine gun added that fires off the right vehicle arc and one off the left vehicle arc. Arcs are determined very simply with a 45 degree angle or 90 degree angle template. So if you take a look at the way this template is laid out you measure from the corner of the vehicle out and anything that fires out the front arc has to be within that 90 degrees. Anything out the back is the same way there's going to be a 90 degree arc back here. Anything side would be again between those two 90, that 90 degree arc. So be in this direction. And then right side would be up in this direction. Now this is where things get interesting because a vehicle can fire each of its weapons in general at separate targets. Okay, so I could technically target three different units with the weapons on this vehicle. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're when you're actually using the units. Uh, sometimes you may want to combine two units and attack one thing that they can both reach. Sometimes you want to split it up. Remember, the more units you shoot, the more pins you can put down. So the, if all these if since all these can fire at the same target because these two arcs are mutually exclusive, if this one and this weapon fire at the same target, the max that I, this unit can put down is one pin on that unit. But if these are targeted two separate units, each of those units could be taking a pin. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're deciding what to shoot with what. All right? Okay, so let's now focus on that half track with the three guns. So every transport is always able to fire one of its weapons with its order die. It can always fire one weapon. And you can choose which weapon it would be. And that weapon fires at the experience level of the vehicle itself. The other weapons on the transport cannot fire unless the vehicle is actually transporting models. And the key here is that each weapon requires one man to man. So if I load this 10 man squad in there, I've got 8 men so I can man both of those machine guns. If I have a 2 man leader officer team and they get in, each of them could man a different machine gun. If I only had a single model officer, for example, that got in there, only one of these two weapons could also fire when the order dice is given to the tra half track. Okay, so. When you're dealing with transports, you want to include models in there that can do some shooting. Now, the only exception is the medic. The medic can never fire any weapons in the half track because they're not supposed to be able to shoot. So always keep that in mind. So let's pull that off for now. Okay, so let's talk first about what happens if you fail the order test? Let's say you want to give a fire order or an advance order, and you fail. The, the, the vehicle fails. Just like infantry, it, the vehicle is going to go down. Okay, now it actually doesn't get cover bonuses, but 
it is considered to have failed sorter test and is you put the down or dice up next to it as a down order. Now in addition, vehicles have to execute a reverse move. A reverse move is always in the a straight backward motion that is one half its normal advance distance. So a truck would have to back up uh, six inches. A half track or uh, fully tracked vehicle will have to back up four and a half inches. They half they will continue until they stop. They they they're forced to stop by the presence of another unit or an obstacle or terrain feature they cannot cross. So, for example, if this truck failed its order test, it will move, execute a reverse order directly away from the closest unit it can see, and it will go backward to within one inch, just more than one inch from that vehicle. That's as far as it can move. Okay. This vehicle here, for example, would back four and a half inches up and would be able to go over the hedge, but it would stop before it got to this half track. Okay. Uh, similarly, if it was headed in this direction, it would stop before it reached the infantry. Okay, so that's what happens when you fail an order test with the vehicle. All right, so let's talk about uh, damaging vehicles. There are two types of vehicles in general. You have soft skin, such as trucks, and even motorcycles. So, for example, this unit here would also be considered a soft skin vehicle. Okay. Now, they are a 6 plus to wound, or you will call it a wound. Just like, remember, the regulars, regular infantry are killed or wounded on a 4 plus, veterans on a 5 plus, soft skin have a 6 plus. But they're not automatically removed when you hit to get that 6. You actually, a 6 on there indicates that you can roll on the damage chart, which I'll show you up here in just a second. For each six, now, because you can hit a wound on a six or better, a small arms fire like rifles, pistols, submachine guns, mini machine guns, light machine guns, they can all hurt a truck or, or a motorcycle. So for every six you roll, you will get one roll on the, this damage table right here. And soft skin vehicles, once you score those damages, whatever you roll on that table, is what happens to the vehicle. Now you're going to want to roll them in order, in all honesty, because if you don't actually roll a 4, 5, or 6, the each, you'll see the notice on uh, a 1, 2, or 3, the unit gets an extra pin and something else can happen. So, for example, let's say you hit twice and the first roll, there's the, there's the hit pin for hitting, the first roll is and immobilize. So it can't move anymore and you receive it, you add an additional pin. But then the second roll is stunned. Okay, so again, you have to add another pin because that's the first thing it says. All right, so now you've got three pins. Well, what if the second roll was actually a three and it's on fire? <clears throat> that means you add the, the pin and now you make the morale test. So the order in which that fire occurred, let's say the if the fire was the second roll that you did, the morale check has to be at minus three for those three pins. But if the fire was the first roll, you'd add the first pin from that result, and you'd only have two pins. If it survived the fire test, morale chest, then you'd apply the second damage that you roll, which could be the stun or the immobilize or whatever. If the vehicle ever gets two immobilized results at any point, then it is considered destroyed. Okay, If it fails the morale chest for a fire result, it is considered destroyed. It's abandoned as a flaming hulk. Alright, so that's how vehicles work. That applies to trucks, jeeps, uh, motorcycles, uh, sorry, motorcycle sidecars that are classed as vehicles as opposed to those models that are classed as uh, Infantry. Okay, some infantry can have motorbikes or motorcycle sidecars given to them, almost like giving them horses, right? So, but we're gonna, when you have a motorcycle with a machine gun, like Germans like to have, they that would be a, under a vehicle entry, and again, it would be a soft skin. You treat the damage normally, just as we discussed. 
Okay, let's move on now to armored vehicles, the second type. And that would be any of these that have a 7 plus armor value, or that's what you need to, to hurt them. Okay? When it says 7 plus, that classifies it as first an armored vehicle, and that means because you can't roll a 7 on a D6, none of your small arms fire can actually damage it. Okay? If it's an open top transport, such as these happen to be, then you can uh, actually put a pin on it because that's, w that's one of the disadvantages of being an open top transport. But if it was a fully enclosed transport, you would not take the pin from small arms fire. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> that's the first point. Now, there's a, that means you're going to need heavy weapons. And if you remember, heavy weapons are things like these here. Medium machine, sorry, heavy machine gun, auto cannon, and a tank rifle, flamethrower, those kind of things. All of those have a pen value of plus one or better. And obviously you can roll a d6 plus the pen and you actually reach or exceed seven. This matters, okay, because if you fail, if you hit with a weapon that can penetrate, that can actually score that seven plus, Okay, and we're only talking about seven pluses here because that's mostly what these transports are. There are only a few eight plus transports out there, uh, but those are special. So we're just about sevens. So pretty much every single heavy weapon can hurt them. So you automatically deliver a pin with each hit, and then you roll to see if you pen. So again, six a d6 plus the pen value of your weapon to see if you can glance or penetrate. Okay, so now that you've actually been hit, or you've hit a transport or a vehicle, now you need to roll to see if it's the, the armored vehicle is penetrated. Now, this is where some not modifiers come into play that don't apply to soft skin vehicles. There's two major categories of uh, these. One is going to be the long range uh, for anti personnel, or sorry, anti arm piercing rounds, and then there's going to be the armor facing. Okay, the very first thing is just like we had the facing of the the arcs for firing, those same facings are used to determine what part of the uh, vehicle the shot is coming in from. Is it coming in from the front arc? Is it coming in from one of the side arcs? Is it coming in from the rear? So the very first thing you're going to do for, and this is again, only applies to armored vehicles, not soft skin vehicles. You're going to determine which facing, because front armor, there's no there is no bonuses to penetration when you roll. You'll need the seven plus for for these transports or whatever the armor value is of the vehicle. A side armor shot, you get a plus one pen, which is added to your or existing pen value. And then if you're coming at it from the in the rear arc, it's minus it's a plus two pen, so that makes it much more likely you're going to damage the vehicle. Now, just because you have a plus one pen here, a plus two pen here, does not automatically mean small arms can suddenly hurt an armored vehicle. Small arms can never benefit from those bonuses. Only heavy weapons. Okay? Now, the other bonus, or penalty, I should say, that applies is range. So, if you are firing and you are at short range, you use your normal pen value. If you're firing actually at long range, though, your pen value is minus one of what it's listed. So that means a heavy machine gun at uh, between zero and 18 inches will have a plus one pen. Once it's over 18 inches away, it now has a zero pen. So a heavy machine gun greater than 18 inches away from a armored vehicle like this cannot damage it. However, from the side or rear, it could again damage it from long range. So if armor facing and ranges now matter. So now once you know your penalties, your modifiers to pen, now you actually make your penetration roll. So let's just pretend I'm using an anti-tank rifle at short range against this half track. And I just roll my pen value. There's three things that can happen. I could fail to penetrate the vehicle at all because my plus two does not, in the two plus the dice roll, does not equal or exceed the armor value, which is seven, okay? 
and I don't have any modifiers. Now, if I, so if I roll a 4, plus 2 for the anti-tank rifle, I don't penetrate from the front. I would, uh, that would be, a, I'd have a plus 1 pen, so it'd be basically a 3, so on a, I have a score of 7 on the side, and basically an 8 on the rear is what, is what I would end up rolling, because, again, the plus 1, so the 2, uh, ATR plus 4 is 6, plus 1 if I was going against side armor would make it 7, plus 2 against rear armor would have made it 8. And that's what my pen result would be. Now, if I match exactly what its armor value is, so in this case a 7, so if this came in from the side and I rolled the 4 plus the 2 and a uh, tank rifle pen plus the uh, bonus for the side, I rolled a 7. It's considered a glancing hit. When I do exactly the no number on the, the penetration roll that I've equals its armor value, the glancing hit means I subtract three from the roll on the damage table. Okay, we'll we'll talk about the damage in a second. Now, if I score greater than the value of the armor here, so again, so this is armor value seven. If I rolled a six from the front armor, my added tank rifle is plus two at short range. Six plus two is eight. It's more than the armor. Great. I now am able to roll a normal hit, normal penetration damage roll on the table. And I'll roll whatever the whatever my die result is, is what happens. We'll talk about it in just a second. There's one more thing that could happen. I could have an anti-tank weapon that is larger, more deadly. For example, one of the Panzer Shreks or Panzer Faust or Bazookas we talked about earlier. A bazooka against this could, you know, remember it has a plus five penetration value for a bazooka, plus six for a Panzerfaust and Panzerschreck. So right there is a huge advantage. On a one, uh, on a 1d6 plus that penetration value, if I score three more than what I need to penetrate in this, and in this case I need a seven to penetrate, so if I score a 10 or greater, I do what's called massive damage. Okay, And that's important because massive damage, I roll twice on the damage table and apply both results. Now you'll want to apply, roll them individually just as we talked about with the, uh, the uh, soft skin vehicles. Because again, the order in which you get the pins may matter. Alright, so again, we have several things that can happen. You can completely fail to penetrate, you can do a glancing hit, you can just do a penetrating hit, or you can do massive damage. A lot of possibilities there. Now one modifier that uh, I do want to bring up right now special is the shaped charge modifier. If you'll remember I talked about the anti-tank rival and the heavy machine gun and really all the heavy weapons having this minus one penetration value uh, penalty for long range shots. That does not apply to a weapon that has shaped charges. Okay, Again, bazookas, piats, uh, panzer shreks, and panzer fausts. You ignore that long range which is a great benefit when you're trying to take out armor. So that's what we need to know about actually rolling for penetration on a vehicle. Okay, now that we've actually rolled on a, uh, a successful penetration, we now consult this damage chart. And you'll notice there's only six options, and four through six is destroyed. One, two, and three are the ones that could be something less than destroyed. But now there's a couple things we're going to do. First of all, if you get a glancing hit, or glancing uh, hit instead of a penetrating hit, meaning you exactly equal the armor value, you roll on the table and subtract 3. So that means the best you can do is a 6 minus 3 is a 3. So the best you can do is make it catch on fire. Most of the time, 4 out of 6 times, you're going to make it just stunned. Okay, so that's what's called a glancing hit. Now, when it comes to a normal hit, you just roll a normal penetration hit, you roll normally on the table and apply the results. So that's when you exceeded the armor value by at least 1. In the case of these transports, it means I rolled an 8 or better. All of a sudden now, whatever happens on the table is what I apply damage, just like we did in soft skin vehicles. In the case of massive damage, like I mentioned, you roll twice on this table, one at a time, again, just in case the you don't actually knock it out with the 4, 5, or 6, but a fire result comes up. Okay? Alright, so that's how you damage vehicles. Alright, now let's talk specifically about transports here and another effect of taking damage on a vehicle. If you have units in this in the 
the transport. And this transport is an M5 half track. It has a capacity of 12. Let's just say I'm going to put this 10 man unit of uh, my Polish 1st Armored Division Dragoons in there, along with their lieutenant and his radioman. There's my 12 models. I can fit them all in that half track. But they're at risk. Remember, as I mentioned before, every time the vehicle is, takes a pin, then each of the occupying units also take a pin. Okay, So if the vehicle takes a penetrating hit, let's say I roll, it becomes stunned because that was a roll of one on the table, it would get a second pin and then so would the guys inside each unit. Okay, So those pins, like I said before, can stack up. But what happens if you roll an immobilized result? Or it's destroyed or it fails its fire test. Let's talk about that. So in the case of an immobilized result, let's take a look at the table again. See number two it says assign one extra pin and then the target is immobilized. So you mark it with a counter and saying it's immobilized. Now as soon as that happens the occupants are forced because it's immobilized to bail out of the vehicle each unit will roll a d6 and move that far. So the leader is going to be within one inch of the vehicle since I rolled so poorly. So they're going to, not within one, they're going to, they're going to go out one inch and be just one inch away from the vehicle. Because remember, we have to keep the one inch separation. And then this unit is only going to make it out two inches. So they're going to have to string themselves around a little bit so I can get them, because I don't want to string them out too much, but I don't want to clump them together too much. So there we go. So now they've bailed out. Okay, so that's the result of them being immobilized. Now, what you'll also need to do immediately upon them disembarking is put a down order on those uh, models, regardless of whether they have an order die or not. So, if they had an order die already on them, such as they were staying, in the, they had embarked on the vehicle with an advance or a run order, for example. Or maybe you, you, you already gave them down or a rally. You just change that die to a down order. And this indicates that they're scrambling to get out and take cover from the vehicle that just got hit. Okay. Now, <clears throat> that is the nicest thing that can happen to units in a vehicle that's been destroyed or damaged. If you roll... A four, five, or six in the unit, the model, the transport is destroyed, or you actually roll a three to do the fire, get a fire result, and the transport fails its morale check, and it's considered destroyed. Now, all of a sudden, the units inside need to do exactly the same thing. They need to bail out, taking the pins that they're supposed to take as a result. You'll notice in the damage table here, four, five, and six, no extra pin is delivered, like there is on three, two, and one. So keep that in mind. But there's something worse happens. Whether they were forced to bail out because of, it was on fire, or failed its, failed its morale test for the fire, or it was destroyed, the opponent gets to roll a d6 for each unit that disembarked, came out of the vehicle. And that is the number of hits that unit takes. So this two-man squad can take five hits. Now these hits are just... There's no bonuses, so if this is a vet squad, a vet leader, he's gonna you're gonna roll five dice, and he's gonna they're gonna die on fives and sixes. If it's regular, it's fours or better. Now this is important because this damage is taken, and if there happens to be again a medic nearby, you can obviously potentially avoid those. And the medic, if you have a medic in there, and he's also the one to bail out, you may want to. Uh, save him for last so that maybe you can save some of these other guys from dying before you finally check to see if the medic dies. Because a single man unit taking five hits is likely to get killed. So this is why it's dangerous to have units in a transport when it's under fire. But see again, you have a ten man squad and you roll a four. There's only four guys that can be hurt. Okay, So you're not going to have as much of a problem uh, surviving something like that with a large squad. It's not so bad, but the fact that you can have smaller units in here and potentially, here in this case, take six hits on a two-man team can be devastating. Now remember, 
the roll to wounds are not modified by the down because this is the damage you're taking from being in the vehicle as it's trying as it's been hit and maybe the shrapnel is blowing up or they're getting burned or whatever it's just the only mod there's no modifiers you just roll them around their uh, normal unit quality to wound three four or five or better depending on the inexperienced regular veteran all right so that's what th happens when a vehicle a transport vehicle is destroyed with occupants in it. Alright. Okay, let's talk about charging enemy vehicles. Okay. Charging enemy vehicles is just like charging infantry. Okay. Now again, we're not talking about armor values of eight or higher. We're talking about these transport vehicles with armor values of six or seven. Okay. We'll talk about the other stuff in the next video. All the same rules for charging apply. You know, you, your distance over obstacles or through rough ground, you just have to make a charge run to there. The vehicle will be able to do re uh, reaction fire as long as it's more, the, you're charging from more than six inches away and it doesn't have an order dial already on it. All those still apply. <clears throat> but now, once you go in to close combat, now things are a little different. Instead of rolling to hit, uh, sorry, instead of rolling to wound, you're actually rolling to hit. Now, in this case, you're not shooting, so you, these hits do not deliver a pin. Okay. All right, so now let's just talk about how you do a round of combat. Whether it's a soft skin vehicle or an armor vehicle, you do this same step. The first thing is you look at the order die that's on the targeted vehicle. If it is a fire order, a down order, um, a rally order, uh, it could be an uh, ambush order, just anything but a run or advance, you are going, or even if it doesn't have an a order die on it yet, you are going to hit it on fours or better. If it has an advance on it, order on it already, you're going to hit on sixes only. And if it actually has a run order on it, you're not going to be able to hurt, hit it at all. So don't even bother charging something that has a run order on it. Okay. So let's just assume, for argument's sake, that you're going to have, be hitting it on 4+. plus. Each man in the squad gets one die roll, and you're rolling to determine not whether you're wounded or not. You're actually rolling to, to determine the hits, and each hit gives you a plus one pen value. And right now, you start out with a zero pen value, okay? So again, whether it's a soft skin or armored, this is the same. You roll your dice, four plus, let me get rid of all those. There's, I've got six, okay? Total of six, so I have a six pen. All right, this is important because, as within shooting, any time you roll in the, to penetrate a vehicle, a roll of a one always fails. No matter how big your pen values are, even if I had plus 10 pen because everybody hit, if I rolled a 1 on this next roll, I don't penetrate. Okay? Now, this next step differs between the two values here, the two vehicles here. In the case of the uh, armored vehicle, you're, you're going to compare to the front armor value. Okay, which is the 7. In the case of the soft skin, it's the 6+. plus. It's always 6+. plus. So you roll the 1 die, and let's just... You know, I, I had a 6, so let's just say I roll... And okay, I rolled more than a 1, so I actually succeeded. Now, whenever it's a soft skin vehicle, I automatically just roll on the damage chart. Okay? And whatever happens, you know, happens just like in shooting. Now, in the case, however, of a armored value or vehicle, I treat it just like it was shooting. So I would compare my, remember I had a six pen, so six plus three is a nine. Nine is two more than seven, so I have, I have penetrated the vehicle, okay? So I would roll once on the damage table. Had I exactly met the armor value, then I would do a glancing hit. If I rolled double or more than, you know, 10 base of 10 or more, three more than I needed to, uh, you know, than its armor value, I would do massive damage again. However, with one exception. If the unit charging them 
does not have anti-tank grenades, whether it's upgraded or whether it comes with it. If they do not have anti-tank grenades, the best they can ever do is a glancing hit. And you'll roll 1d6 and subtract 3 on the damage table. Aside from that, if they're using anti-tank grenades, you roll for regular penetration, you roll for potentially massive damage. Okay. Now, if the vehicle survives, then you retreat your men one inch away. In this case, you only have one round of combat, unlike infantry versus infantry. This is one chance. You go in, you back off. Even on a, a soft skin vehicle. Okay, That's just how it works. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about dealing with um, these transports is the difference between a closed top vehicle, regardless of its armor value, and an open top vehicle, again, regardless of, open, of its armor value. If the unit entry of the vehicle has the special rule open top, you don't need to roll on that damage table. If you are score a hit, whether it's a glancing or penetrating or massive damage hit on that vehicle. Because it's open top, it is automatically destroyed. There is no chance. There's no role to determine. It simply is destroyed. So, assaulting half-tracks, open top half-tracks, scout cars, universal carriers, it's all very, very deadly for the, the half-track because it's open top. It's very easy, relatively speaking, to take those out. Okay. Now, I don't know how many vehicles, again, in the different countries have you know enclosed armored personnel carriers but those would not be subject to this you know if hit or if penetrated it's dead so pay close attention to your unit entries uh, for the vehicles that you are wanting to charge or the ones that are being charged okay all right let's set up one more piece of uh or one more event what happens if the transport that is, that is actually carrying units is charged by an enemy unit infantry unit so that's actually very simple the vehicle would get to do its reaction fire as normal if it can it can also choose not to but at that point the occupants of the vehicle must disembark or dismount and prepare to fight regardless of what order there may already be on those units so let's just pretend I have a uh, officer squad of two guys and an infantry squad of five inside the vehicle. They're supposed to dismount and the attacking unit it actually engages them in close combat instead. All right, so after the units dis dismount, the largest unit is the one that the attacker is going to engage. If both are equally large, then the attacker chooses which of the two he's going to fight. And that's that's where the close combat happens instead of against the vehicle. Now, in this case, we place the models just outside the vehicle. In our where we play, we like to place them between the uh, transport and the enemy, uh, sorry, the enemy attacking unit simply to prevent the models from uh, actually getting in there, just visually, right? So you don't need to like, measure distances. You don't do an advance out. You simply dismount. You get out of the vehicle and put them nearby and then engage in the attack. Okay? Okay, so from this point on, if the infantry combat is just like what we covered earlier uh, in last edition, last uh, lesson. Okay. Now, one thing I want to clarify here, or not clarify, but point out is the way the rule is written about these units in the transport is they're supposed to come out and engage the guys coming out. So, again, in our group, we bring and put the units out right in front of the transports, you know, within a you know three inches or so. Just get the unit in front so that it has a full inch away. It's a full inch away from the uh, transport and stays in cohesion. So it's not a special move or anything. But now what I've heard happening also out there is some guys will disembark that big unit and, you know, disembark them, you know, back here somewhere. And, you know, back here, for example, outside, this, and then bring these guys here, forcing the attacker to go way over here. And that, to me, just feels wrong. 
okay? I don't know that I would ever agree with that because these guys are supposed to get out to engage the attacker, not get back out here and the, the attacker's going to go over there. It does not make sense. So I would recommend that you play it basically exactly as written. The units come out and basically put themselves between the transport and the oncoming uh, infantry. Okay, the last topic we're going to cover is reserves, okay? And there's two aspects to reserves. When you are playing a scenario, any the scenario will dictate whether or not you have uh, units starting on the table or not, or if anything can be in reserve or not. Reserve is a simple concept. It basically means you don't bring, you have, you start models off the table. And those can include transports that have men in them, okay? Now, reserve rules apply to all vehicles and all infantry units, all every unit entirely. Okay, so let's talk about how you do reserve. The, the scenario will specify how you decide which units or how many units are in reserve. At that point, you just you have decided. Well, for example, we'll have the scout car with five men in it. That's going to be in reserve. The rest are going to be deployed on the table. I cannot bring this unit in until turn two, at the earliest. Now, again, I choose when to bring it in. Now, the order die for both of these units is still in the bag with all these order dice from the units that are deployed on the table. Okay. Now, so, when I'm going through the first turn and I get an order die, I can either give it to a unit on the table or I can put it, give one of these units a down order since they're going to have to stay in outside the table uh, first turn anyway. And what that does is it kind of force, gives you time to force your opponent to get more stuff on the table or get a key unit in a position where you can take advantage of it with a later die. So the next order that comes out again you have, you'd have to give it to the guys inside the transport. In this case okay I'll have to give them a down order because they can't come in so you give them a down order then you go on with the rest of your merry way. Now, reserves have, a, most of the time, there's a couple uh, special units and uh, the entire U.S. Army don't have this penalty. However, if you are in reserve with a unit, you have to make an order test to come on. Okay? And that means you, you have to, so the skill matters. So inexperienced transport has an order, or uh, morale of eight, so that's already going to be harder to do it. The worst thing is, every unit that comes in from reserve has to make a morale test at minus one. So an inexperienced unit is coming in on a seven, regular on an eight, vet on a nine, unless they have a special rule that avoids that penalty. So again, you make you decide, okay, I want to bring this, this transport in on turn two, I'm going to roll a morale test. There's a six, I made it. So now he comes on the guys are inside. They've also, they're now also on the table, technically, sort of. And you get to move this on with either an advance or run order, whatever you want to do. Bring them on the table. So there's the, there, the, he's finally on the board. Now, the unit inside can now come off and do its thing because it was in there when the, when the unit arrived. And that's reserves. If you have questions, again, put them in the comments below. I'll, I'll answer them as they come in. Okay. All right, so let's wrap up this uh, training video with one additional rule. And this one's actually pretty easy to forget, but it's extremely important. Because transports are not really designed to be uh, combat machines, they are there to support the infantry. Bolt actions included a special rule for transports. As long as they're occupied, you don't have to worry about this, but as soon as you have a transport that is empty, an enemy unit... At the can actually cause that transport to flee the table if it's closer to your transport than one of your own other models. So here's here's how it works. At the end of a turn, for you take a look at any empty vehicle. Let's let's assume both of these vehicles here are empty. Okay. So I have a infantry squad here near both of them right now. And here's an enemy squad. Okay, we'll pull it up here. This squad is coming up, and 
whether they're trying to charge or not, they're they're physically located within about three inches of this, this half track. Okay. Well, fortunately, I've got a unit here that's within less than three inches, so I'm good. Both these vehicles stay. But let's pretend for so. Let's say at the end of the turn, this unit was up here. Uh, let's move back here so you can actually see. Uh, it's back closer to this white scout car than it is to this half track. Matter of fact, this is less than three inches. This is a little over three inches. Now, this half track is close. Has an enemy unit closer. This half track flees the field. The order die is removed from the bag is considered a casualty, even though it's really not a casualty. It's considered one. Now, if, for example, this white scout car is closer than this enemy unit, if there is infantry inside this white scout car, that half track is safe. But if there are infantry, if there are no infantry, it's also an empty scout car, then it does not prevent the fleeing of this half track. In fact, you have to double check both, make sure something is closer. In this particular case, this half track is closer to the enemy unit, it flees. The white scout car is still closer to this infantry unit here, so it stays. Had these been a little further away, this one could also leave. Okay, so that's the rule. We very pay very close attention to at the end of the turn, watch your empty transports and how close they are to enemy models. It's a good thing to check right before you pick up the dice. Okay. Right, so that's essentially the rules for the vehicles and special weapons. So we didn't really add a lot to it. Just a few, if you will, variations on a theme. And it really didn't take a whole lot, did it? Now, we're about to embark on the next field exercise where we'll go ahead and watch uh, my friend Dave learning the game, playing his second bolt action game, learning these same rules. Now, you'll see in this particular uh, battle report, my opponent will have a transport. I will also have a transport, but I will, in addition, in order to make my list uh, have enough points uh, to match his, I will also have an armored car. So again, though, that armored car isn't really a lot of specialness to it. Uh, it has the same armor values as the, the half-track my opponent has, but it has one of the special weapon options called an anti-tank rifle that my opponent didn't use. So this way you get to see a couple different uh, special weapons used on both sides of the field. So we'll just go now and Go ahead and watch that video, the battle rep, and see if the rules start to make sense. So thanks for sticking with me through this project. I hope you're learning the game, and I hope you're enjoying this video series. If you've got friends who want to play Bolt Dash or are interested, send them this way. Share this. Like this. Please, please subscribe to the channel, especially if you're new to the game. Click that notification bell, and you'll stay in touch with me on all the videos that I put out. All right. Thanks very much. Let's meet on the field. Bye-bye.